Welcome to the Boomer Woman's Podcast. I'm your host, Agnes Knowles. I've had a recurring idea about relocating to another country, at least for a while. I've contemplated just hitting the road, being of no fixed address. I'm still on the fence, so I keep finding women who have done one or the other, or both. Today's guest is a serial expat. She's lived in a variety of countries, sometimes for a short while, sometimes for years. So she knows the ups, the downs, the befores, the afters. She's also mid-age, so it was easy to talk about the ups, the downs, the befores, the afters. And also the what-ifs. We're all getting older. Decreasing health is a possibility. Death is waiting somewhere in our future. Doreen has great insights and tips on all of it. Being prepared is a huge part of it all. Listen now. My family and friends hear me talk about spending extended periods of time in interesting places. My friend in the Dominican Republic is an expat and she tempts me often. I have family in Spain and six months on the Costa Blanca sounds like a dream. One of my favorite movies is Under the Tuscan Sun. Ah. I talk myself out of it. You might have the same excuses. Soccer Saturday with the grandchildren. I have elderly clients. The dog. Except mine passed away last fall, and I will admit one of the first thoughts was, can't use her as an excuse anymore. And then there's a day like today. It's dreary, it's chilly, can't even step outside without a coat. And all those excuses haunt me. Abu keeps in touch with her grands with FaceTime. I'm not getting another pet for a reason. (laughs) And I'm not the only companion caregiver in the city. My clients will find another. My guest today has obviously divested herself of excuses, if she ever had any. Doreen has lived and worked across cultures in eight countries as a junior diplomat, a corporate climber, an entrepreneur, and an accompanying spouse over the last four decades. Are you curious? Doreen Cumberford, welcome to the Boomer Woman's podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's it's great to be here. And I loved your introduction, Agnes. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, I'm looking forward. I've told so many people about this interview today. So uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot of people are interested. Good, good. I'm going to start at the beginning. You're originally from Scotland. I am. Certainly the same climate as here on Canada's West Coast. Yes. Were you just waiting for your first opportunity to get somewhere else? Or did life just sort of unfold? I think life unfolded very naturally for me, but um, I do believe that it is a matter of the environment that you grow up in, because I grew up in an environment where my mother's brother lived in Burma at that time. Myanmar was called Burma. And so I had relatives who were overseas. And when I was six years old, my mother decided when we moved into this big house, sort of a big brownstone type house with three stories in Glasgow, she decided she'd rent out the rooms and she rented them to KGB agents who were Russian. So from the age of six till 10, I heard Russian in the house. I was introduced to the composers. I, my mother put me in ballet and dance and the, level of the geographic national geographic magazines was almost as tall as myself in that house so i was programmed for this life and this lifestyle way before it ever happened and many people don't have that sort of programming i think i was just thinking of the difference in our in our growing up years because i did as a bold young woman, moved from the west coast of Canada here, where I was born and raised, uh, out to Toronto, which is only middle Canada. And I remember my father being so disgruntled. He said, well, I hope you have your passport so you can get back, you know, because it was just so far away. So, uh, hmm, yeah, yeah there lies. that answers a whole bunch of questions right there. Yes, yes. Okay, so we talked about eight countries. How long were your okay. stays? 
As a junior, well, I moved to uh, London <laughs> and I consider England as a different country yeah. <laughs> because, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, the culture, the pace, the way of life and the language, especially back then, was quite different. I was in London for a year or so and then I went to Cameroon. I was there for two years and then I was in Dubai for maybe four to five years, four years. And then from there, I moved to the US of A, which was my first big experience with um, radical culture shock. I moved there with a fellow I had married. And he did not last long, which is one of the reasons I'm very passionate about repatriation on the process. Of, I'm writing a second book on the subject now. So <laughs> I stayed in the U.S., through the 80s, and I met a, someone else halfway through the 80s. We got married and we had a baby in the early 90s. So I was in I was in the U.S. for a decade. Let's just call it a decade. And then from there, we went to, to Japan for two years, Saudi Arabia for 15. And I have a book out about that. Then we moved back to the U.S. in 2010. And then we started being nomads in 2015 because we discovered that we really hadn't, we weren't finished with our traveling experiences and there's still more places we want to go. Okay. I want to back up the bus just a little bit here. <laughs> I guess because I'm next door neighbors with the United States. Uh, how was that your greatest culture shock? I think moving, especially in the 80s, from I moved directly from the Middle East to the US and it was stridently the worst culture shock. Now, part of it was I moved to Louisiana and Louisiana has a very, the South in general of the US has a completely different culture from many of the other states. We're very blasé in the America, in the US, about the fact that we have so many cultures and there are so many natural culture clashes going on just by virtue of the history and people's expectations. And so I moved to Louisiana. Their English was strange. It was mixed with French, but I had been a French speaker, a real Parisian type French speaker in Cameroon. And then, so I had to learn this version of Quebecois, which was sort of the old version of, you know, more like, more like Quebecois, which is different from French French. And so I had to learn and distinguish that. They changed, people changed my name. My name is not that weird or different, although most people who meet me in America who are above 60 and above call me Jolene. I was like, no, it's not. It's Doreen. So they changed my name, which really, I think, in some ways was a bit of an affront. And I didn't have the courage at that time with my new in-laws to say, no, that's not my name. I want my full name. They called me D. Well... That doesn't really resonate for me. I felt like when I spoke, do you remember Mork and Mindy? Mm -hmm. And That's Mork that. and Mindy had this signal and, and he would go, Nanu, Nanu, Nanu. And that's how I felt anytime I was addressed and had to speak to someone. Because at that, even at that time, I still had a very diplomatic accent and it was quite British and it was quite, you know, marble at the back of the throat kind of accent. And moving to Louisiana was the hardest thing I have ever done. It was harder than going to Cameroon. It was harder than living in Japan. And I didn't understand the line. Well, I understood French and Cameroon, but... I, I did not know very much Japanese when I went to Japan. It it was just culturally an absolute slap. And I don't want to do that again. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. Now you talk about, I'm going to read this to get it right, intercultural interactions. Is that the type of thing that we've just been talking about or what, what exactly yeah. is? 
Yes. So in in the intercultural world, there are several things that go on. Some of the things that you see, you'll see a lot of uh, things that are talking about uh, intercultural communication, and that is communication between cultures or across cultures, which frequently is between la different languages, often translated through English if, if both parties speak their unique native languages plus English. But then the next thing is intercultural competency. And intercultural competency is a series of competencies that can be measured and can be managed in order to teach people to have a, a better and more coherent experience across cultures. I mean, even between the US and Canada, there are small, there are definitely cultural differences. And the third thing, um, and I've just um, interviewed about six people on this, is the subject of cultural intelligence. And cultural intelligence is about how motivated are you to really cross a culture? How, um, how much knowledge do you have? How much preparation do you have? And um, exactly what do you need to cross that culture? Because... Culture is invisible. We don't see it. We just talk about it. We hear. We see it enacted out all the time, but we can't put our finger on that word exactly. Okay. So to, as you were explaining that, I'm thinking it, it does. Does it? I'm going to say it does, but I'll ask you the question: Does it boil down to a respect of where you are? Um, respect is one of the elements. There are several elements, and respect is one of them. Okay. I'm just thinking if if I go to a place where life is considerably different, I can't expect to be living like, uh, you know, a middle age, middle class Canadian. Yes. So. Um, however, many people do. <laughs> you know, that happens. Okay. <laughs> it does happen. And we take our culture with us when we move and we... Uh, we disturb, we shake up, we change the natural culture of any place that we go to by virtue just of our presence. Okay, good point there. Now, as you traveled, mm -hmm. did you consider yourself a Scot or are you now, because you've traveled so much, more of, is it called a global citizen? Well, um, there, there's many aspects to this. And the, the thing you have to go back to is uh, what identity do you want to choose? What identity are you in the process of creating? What identity do you want to cling to? And I have several, I have a heart that I made online with all the flags of all the countries I had ever lived in. And then I moved to Mexico less than two years ago. And now I have to have it remade <laughs> with that other flag in there because you actually have to expand yourself. Yeah, yeah. You really have to make an effort to be who you want to be. And Scotland is my native, I would say my love country. It's the country that really raised me. It's the country, I love our traditions. I love my our people. I love the fact we're, you know, one of the largest diasporas in the world and there's more Scots, there's 60 million Scots living overseas and only five in the country. I love the fact that that our traditions are portable and we can carry them around and, and transplant them. So I would say it is my heart culture. However, along the way, I have picked up many other cultures so does that mean that as you've been introduced to other cultures, you've gone, I really like this piece and I'm yeah. going to incorporate it into myself? Yes, exactly. And you can't, I, I mean, I'm living in Mexico now most of the time. And in Mexico, it's very difficult to bring all of my Japanese culture with me, <laughs> but there are some things like I have a house that doesn't really have a garden because few houses in Japan and the cities have gardens. But, you know, I have tremendous amount of flowers and I can do wonderful things with very few flowers because I studied a cabana in Japan. So I can bring that to Mexico 
And I have brought that to Mexico along with Ikebana containers and things that I purchased in Yokohama and, and Tokyo. I can also bring things like I prefer not to wear shoes in the house. And so I have like indoor socks, indoor shoes for the house in Mexico. That's a Japanese tradition. Um, but I did not bring the tradition of bowing with me because that would not be appropriate in Mexico. And people would think, what is she doing? So that's just an example of how you can um, make a, part, a culture portable and bring it with you. That's a great explanation. Thank you. Before we go on, you've already used two words that I was going to ask you to explain, uh, mm -hmm. just so that everybody's on the same page. The first is expat, and then repat. Could yes. you just explain those, please? I'd be happy to. So an expat is someone who moves from their home culture and transplants themselves in another place, in another country, for a decent period of time. And let's say maybe a year, two years. In some people's cases, it can be 30 or 40 years. It can be decades. Now we have, especially since COVID times, now we have access to something called nomads. And there's a lot of people who, it's, it's like they just woke up and discovered there was a world out there. It's like, what were you thinking before? <laughs> That's what my perspective is. What did you think was out there before? <laughs> and so it's really fun um, to see uh, digital nomads, global nomads, and people just nomading for periods of time, more periods of time across the globe. I would not call them planted expats, but I would call them global nomads okay. because they're traveling. Maybe they're traveling for one year, two years, 10 years. Um, there are people who, let's say, have no idea what the long-term consequences are of living abroad. And I am really more interested in the unintended consequences and the long-term um, effects that international living exposes a human to. To answer your second question, <laughs> repatriation. So a repat is someone who has lived overseas for a number of years, let's say two years, five years, 15 years, and they return home. And when we return home, we tend to as humans think, okay, I'm just gonna pack up my suitcases, my container with all my furniture, my animals, um, my life and move the stuff back, including my body, get on a plane and 12 hours later, I can be in a whole different environment. Unfortunately, we take ourselves wherever we go and it's not that simple. And so when you've gone overseas and you've lived in a culture and been affected by language, by culture, by different expectations, perhaps a different way of life, when I lived in Saudi Arabia, for instance, I heard, I can't remember, something like 25,000 prayer calls. Wow. So when that sort of metronome is going off in one's brain, it changes you. And for the first probably three years I lived in the States, I was like, I, I don't know what time it is. I don't know where, where I am. Well, when's the next prayer call? Because you know, sun up, sun down, and the three in between, they were our pace of life. And I loved that, actually. I grew to love it. I didn't love it at first, but I grew to love that. And so when you return, you have to unwind and rewind all of that intercultural experience, which is all subconscious and invisible. It's not something that's out in the open that you can see and that other people go, oh, she's a repat. They can't tell by looking at me that I lived overseas all these years. And this is the sort of phenomenon that our service people, our militaries, our diplomats, our NGOs, all those sorts of missionaries, people who have lived and worked overseas for a long period of time, face an enormous challenge when they go through repatriation. 
Well, oh, that's so interesting because you sort of think that, you know, especially your birth country, that it would almost like be falling back into. But as you were explaining that, I thought, yeah, just that, like the prayer calls. It, yeah. it, it would just be that constant in your life that, as you said, you you noticed it when you first got there. But after a while, it was just almost your way of identifying what part of the day you were in. And it became a given. Yeah. Yeah. And so Repats, um, in my next book, uh, it's called Sequel. I'm not sure about the subtitle. Subtitle is something like how to move back from overseas with ease and grace. <laughs> because what we do is we pack our mental baggage with expectations. So we have expectations. We have memories of our friends and family. Oh, they're just going to show up and they're going to be so excited and they're going to want to hear all the stories and they're going to want to listen and they're going to want to. No, (laughs) they don't want any of those things. They might not even show up. They have, they're busy. They've moved on to new things. They don't necessarily have space in their lives for you. I've interviewed a few nomads on on podcasts and Mm -hmm. what you're saying is just it's ringing so true they haven't been they haven't been able to voice it quite as well as you are but yeah that's interesting all that uh yeah time, time goes by in everybody's life yeah so we have expectations we have hidden expectations we have um we have memories, we have perceptions, uh, we have, you know, expectations is just all of those. And that's in our, our invisible luggage. And so what I do in the book is talk about, you know, this is invisible luggage, but you still have to unpack it. <laughs> it sucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then just accommodating the people who yeah. haven't gone anywhere. Because, yes. Yeah. Yes. And then finding your tribe, because it's exhausting spending time with people who've been nowhere after you've been a lot of places. Yeah. There's just a huge accommodation has to be made, not on the part of the returnee, but on the part of the person who's been there. It's like, how many times do we have to listen to her stories? And, you know, you know people have opinions and perceptions about all of that, and they deserve those opinions and perceptions. Yeah, and sometimes because... I, I would think that, you know, you've had an interesting life that some people who have gone nowhere might have a, a type of jealousy. Yeah. Resentment. Know, and, yeah, yeah. Resentment. That's a good word. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's quite common. Mm. It's quite common and not discussed very frequently. <laughs> yeah. No, I could see that. Yeah. Because it could definitely be an argument in the making shall we say yes it could definitely be a pain point right there (laughs) okay one of your talking points is um the common challenges expats face while adjusting to a new culture and how to overcome them could you talk to us about that i think you've touched on it especially when you moved to louisiana but uh... (laughs) sure um you know when I was when I moved to Louisiana, it was a little bit different because I thought I was migrating to America and I was going to be here in America forever. And I think that my expectations were so great that that was part of the problem for me. But when you are an expat and you are moving to a new culture, one of the things you have to learn is, you know, well, what is your position in that culture? Are you going to be employed? Are you going to work for corporate? Do you have a job, to, a day job to go to? And if you do, is that going to take up eight to 10 hours of your time every day? And if it is, you already are pre-programmed because there's stuff you need to do. But for accompanying spouses, of which there are more men nowadays than there used to be, okay. but many women even now, still find that they can be the ones who have given up a career, a job, an opportunity in order to accompany a spouse on their grand adventure. And um, when you land in a country with no purpose to fill your 24 hours other than just to be there, that can be extremely tough on the soul. And it can bring up a lot of questions about who am I? What do I want? And, you know, it's it, it can become an existential situation. 
And when you're an expat, I, I think it's really important if you are an accompanying spouse, it's very important that you find your why, your own why. Why are you going? Why are you accompanying this person? What's in it for you? You know, what is your mission in life? And be very clear about that. But many expats are also faced with the fact they're going somewhere where they don't speak the language. Like I went to Japan. I didn't speak much Japanese. Still don't. But I learned enough to get around. That is a huge hurdle in itself, uh, just the language. And especially if it's a language like Arabic or Japanese, that the road signs are <laughs> hard to read, let's just say. So how do you get around? Be you know, I was traveling a lot of my expat experience was before the internet and before Google and before this phone and maps. I don't know how I would do what I do nowadays without this. Do, do but, you have a translator as well on the phone? Uh, yeah, I do for, I do for uh, just for Spanish because that's the language I'm working most in now. But as an expat, you have to adjust to a language. You have to adjust to a culture. How do you meet someone? What do you do? Do you bow? Do you shake hands? Do you take a step backwards? Do you turn around and do a jig? What are you supposed to do? Um, I mean, there's very, very simple things that you have to learn in each culture about the etiquette. And then you have, well, what what is my purpose in being here? How do I build my tribe? Who am I looking for who is like me, sounds like me, looks like me, feels like me, who is perhaps in the same boat that I can connect with and build my new life here? So those are just, you know, three or four of the top challenges that expats have or people have when they move abroad to become an expat. I, I was going to ask you about language because you know, often as, as global as English is, there's a lot of countries where the language is so dissimilar. And yeah. it sounds like learning at least some basic things. Yes, yes. That's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yes, definitely. And I know that your audience is um, mostly is a lot of boomer women. Yeah, <laughs> that's us. And so for booming women... You know, I think that it requires that we have more, more gumption. You know, it it's easy at our stage of life, I think, to reflect back on what might have been, what could have been. But it's also, uh, it takes more energy, I think, to actually get oneself into the action and into gear to make a big change like that. And so I think for... Uh, women who are in their third chapter of life, let's say, who are moving overseas, there is quite a lot to be considered. And it really is valuable to sit down and have a chat with someone who's been an expat or um, get some sort of a plan under your feet because there will be bumps in this road of navigating moving overseas. But I have to say there are more and more women all the time. I see Canadians and American boomers who are moving all over the world right now. And, you know, as we age, one of the things that uh, the medical field tells us is to keep your brain sharp. That's something like learning a new, new language is far better than crossword puzzles. So I guess we could even just look at it from that angle and say, okay, I've got to embrace as much of this language as I can. Oh, so. absolutely. That's one of, that's one of the big benefits I think of, of moving is, is in learning a new language, but also I think the the subtle cultural intercultural play that goes on, although we may not be aware of it, at some subconscious level, that is equally valuable and perhaps even more potent to one's soul, as it were, because it's all sort of vague and and it's all sort of subtle, but it's a feeling that you get. What about expat communities? Are, I'd be interested to hear you take on that because part of me says it's a cop-out 
but I also realized that they would have great value. Oh, absolutely. I think that it really depends on the individual and your intrepidness. Now, one of the things that I love about having moved to Mexico is that I'm back in an expat community. And I find expat communities more forgiving, more open, more loving, more patient in general. Every expat community I have ever lived in, that has been the case for me. Now, having said that, I don't think it's healthy to get stuck in the expat bubble. And I am constantly trying to push myself out of that expat bubble, particularly in Mexico with so many of us. I think that it is really valuable to stay in the expat community if you want to build intimate friendships with people who get you and people who understand you. It's good for your self-esteem. It's good for your sense of identity. It's good for your feelings of belonging. And you need to belong something to something. So it's a place to start. The problem is it gets too comfortable. And when you're comfortable, we're not growing. If you're not living outside in that very uncomfort zone, you know, our, our, our comfort zone just keeps us safe. If we're not living at 4% or it's the ideal is to be 4% out of it. 20% out of it is stressful and hard. For within the four to five percent, that's real personal growth, they say. Who they is, scientists, I don't know. I can't quote anyone right now. But that is what I've observed over the last four decades is you cannot stay in that bubble. You have to have cultural mentors. You have to have cultural trainers, as it were, even if they're your next door neighbors and they just speak the local language to you. That is really required to cross the culture effectively. I just went, whoa, 4%. I would do 4%. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'll I'll admit that some of my hesitation, shall we say, reluctance, whatever, in traveling is because I am a solo older woman. So I guess that an expat community would be a good place to land, just just not to stay forever. (laughs) Well, I mean, you can live somewhere forever and you can have, you can make lifetime friendships in these places. I know people who do, but I would say that you, in order to really be somewhere, you have to learn and navigate the local culture. And embrace some local people and some languages in order to make effect intercultural change in your life. Okay, so we're planning on getting out of this place. Mm -hmm. What considerations Mm -hmm. is is there uh, when we decide, okay, like, but where, you know, like, I love the Japanese culture, but it's that huge language barrier. I love Spain because it's wonderful weather, yeah, you know, that sort of thing. What, uh, what do we consider? Well, I think um, every, everyone's consideration list is going to be unique and different because each of us is an unrepeatable miracle, number one. And so I do not have a prescription for that. But I, there is a top five, let's say. And the first thing is you cannot enjoy an overseas lifestyle unless you have good health and well-being. And so a self-examination of your own health and well-being is necessary. You know, are you are you capable of managing a bit of stress in the disruption of moving? Are you willing to, how much, how much time do you spend at the doctors now? And are you, are you, can you limit that or how are you going to navigate that moving forward? And also your sense of well-being, because I think that we have to search our souls to know how we are when we're out of position or, you know, feeling out of sorts. I would say the second thing, first thing is health and well-being, right? I think the next part would be where. I don't think where is necessarily the first part. Actually, I have to kind of admit this. 
I don't think where matters a darn. I'm of the belief that a place can make you more comfortable. You can enjoy it. It can make you slightly happier, but a place will not make you happy. And all the new science on the science of happierness, there is no such thing as happy. It, everything is a, a process of moving towards happierness. And as long as it meets a few of your requirements, like it doesn't rain, you know, 360 days of the year, or you're not walking on permafrost for 10 months of the year, as long as it meets many of your wants or your or your considerations, I say pretty much go for it because one of the major ways that we change and grow, I think is through environmental difference. And I think it also educates us on the environmental state of the earth when we move to a new place that is very vastly different from the place we've lived. So I think that where, yes, it's important, but look at your health and your well-being before you look at exactly where. And also that ties into your health and well-being. What kind of health services are there there? That's part of my notes here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Especially, well, Canadians, yeah, really, yes. We have a lot of Canadian friends who are still have go home to Canada for six months because of the way your system is set up, right? So I think where is very, very important. Other things you have to consider is language. How good are you at learning language? How hard do you want to work? <laughs> uh, are you good? Are you facile with languages? How's your memory? Are you are you good at being stressed? I mean, I get exhausted by listening. If I'm in a Spanish conversation for that's very intense for more than 15 minutes, it's exhausting. My brain is exhausted. So it requires a lot of um, physical and mental energy to process a language. So I would make the language the third thing. The fourth thing I would suggest is the community. Is there a community of like-minded souls who are there that you feel, because you will need that, unless you are a recluse and are used to being very isolated. If you are completely independent and totally isolated, no problem. But I would say the community is number four. You know, how, what is the community there? What does it consist of? Do you need an opera? Do you need a music group? Do you need a walking group? You know, does it have the elements of, of everything you're looking for? And number five, hmm, what would I say number five priority is probably number five priority, I would say is how much does it excite you? How much does it light you up from inside? If it doesn't blow your skirt or your kilt up, as they say in Scotland, then it's probably not a good idea. <laughs> as you were explaining that, and I don't want to accentuate the negative, but <laughs> can, can you sometimes look at why do you want to get out of this place? Oh, yes. I think and you then want. make yeah. sure that whatever you're okay. leaving in a yeah. negative way is yeah. going to be fulfilled where you're going. Ab absolutely. Absolutely. We, we, well, let me just demonstrate with my own story, if that's okay. Oh, we absolutely. came back in 2011 and we moved to Bellingham, Washington, not far from where you are. And I had lived in the desert and hundred and up to 119 degrees <laughs> with very little green trees. And so I was just soaking up all of the environment and the, the green trees and the greenery and a beautiful Pacific Northwest. I was so happy. But then the winter came and it was horrible. It was gloomy. And I had a real mental health problem on my hands. I was looking at being somewhat depressed. And, you know, I'm pretty sure my immune system was probably a little compromised at that time. It was tough. Not only that, but my husband had a, a consulting job. And at that point, he tried to be remote. He was like a pioneer, but they weren't up. Remoteness, remote work was not a thing back then. And so 
we did not stay in the Pacific Northwest for very long because we were commuting, each of us were commuting back and forth to Houston for the next four years. And so that was very hard. So this was not exactly the America that we had thought we were returning to. You know, the expectations had shifted, the goalposts had shifted. And so we stayed here and we decided to move to my husband's original hometown, which was Denver. And we moved there in 20, at the end of 2014. And by a year later, we realized, hey, we're still young enough. We can travel. We have energy. And we turned into international pet sitters. So we, we had a mission. We had a purpose. So we still do that sometimes for fun. And we give other people the option to travel because we take care of their beautiful properties and their wonderful pets. So we're very discerning. But when that happened, we that was 2015 and 2016, we all know what happened. And then from 2016 to 2020, we watched the curvature of the US political situation and the divisiveness and basically by halfway through covid by 2022 we were like looking at where did we want to go live for the rest of our lives and we had my husband wanted to go to to europe i did too he's an irish citizen he has an irish passport uh but we didn't really want to live in a cold rainy country and you know the easy thing was mexico and we honestly made that decision because we've had a lot of hard moves. We've had, we have a lot of miles and they pay off. You know, there is a toll physically, I think, and emotionally for all these miles and all these distance that we've juggled all these years. And our, we have two kids in America, one in Denver and one in Seattle. And we didn't really want to live with an ocean. We wanted the geography to fit better. Because we've lived across oceans for, he grew up actually partly in Japan. So for decades, we have juggled oceans and distance. And, you know, we can get in a car and actually drive across the border from Mexico. So that was, you know, it's not a very esoteric or very grand motivation. But in view of who we were and all the journeys we've taken, and all the lessons we have learned, it was perfect for us. So you have to find out, everybody has to find out what is your perfect next step. And usually if it feels easy and breezy and the energy is all going in the same direction, I say then it's, it's possible that's the right thing to do. And it sounds like it, it can be a, f a fluid thing as well. Yeah. So that because you're all excited about going to country B, you know, and you get there and it's like, oh, crap, this is not what I was expecting. It's like, OK, well, where's country C, you know, and maybe put a little bit more research into it. But uh, yeah. I liken it to, um, to, to buying a house, you know, like the more houses you look at, it's not that you get confused. It's like you you, you start to really know what you want. Exactly. It, it, you really start to figure out what you want. And I knew that living in Mexico was like not my, not my, it's ideal. It's not necessarily my favorite place all year round, but we have some choices. We can go to the beach. It's easy to go. There's lots of beach in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> and we can go, we can come to the States. And so I knew that it would make my life, our lives look a lot more like the way we wanted them to look than staying in the U.S. Now, you touched on health, and mm -hmm. as especially, yes, as Canadians, we really have to consider how lucky we are with our health care. When, when people are looking at where to go, especially at, at this age, you know, we're in our 60s and 70s, sure. ill health is a possibility, yep. and dying is inevitable yes. at some point in time. Do we need to do research around what's available where we want to go as well? Oh, well, I would say definitely. I did uh, two uh, seminars in 2022 or 2021 or 2022 
No, no, 22 and 23 on the subject of death and dying as an expat. I was so shocked to find out no one else is talking about it very oh. much. Yeah, exactly. Um, because expats, people who travel are people who are moving towards a dream. They're not people who are like, oh, maybe I could go. No, they're people who are in motion and actually moving towards a dream. So the thought of that dream being stopped or cut short doesn't usually enter one's mind because you're always planning for, you know, going and something positive. But now I think um, there are more possibilities of how to consider death and dying as an expat. And there are, you have to think about your family, your beliefs, your traditions, your faith. You have to think about your culture. You have to think about your flexibility. You have to think about a wake or a coffin or, you know, and in Mexico, the culture in Mexico requires that you be buried or you be cremated within 24 hours. So that's non-negotiable. So that makes a difference for your family. And so we have done all those things. We actually have a, a service. It's a funeral service we've paid for. So if anything happens to us, one or both of us in Mexico, this funeral service in San Miguel has relationships across the country with other funeral services to bring the body back to San Miguel. And then they do a service and a cremation and a completion there. And all of that is pre-handled. We also have a service for medical emergencies, like medical transportation out of the country. So if you were to be in a very serious accident or some calamity occurs in the health, in the health direction, then we bought a package, which I think lasts four to five years, several thousand dollars. But what it does is it gives us like everything from an air ambulance to, you know, a flying ICU to just a nurse who's been flown down to Mexico to accompany you to a hospital somewhere. All of those packages are available to the international communities now, and there are many of them, and you have to look at them, examine them, and decide which is best for you. I think, too, just from personal experience, my former father-in-law was a Glaswegian. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a whole other story. Um, <laughs> but he said that when he died, he wanted his ashes sent back, to to Scotland yes and that was not doable in any easy way so you've got to really think about that too yeah yeah sure you can cremate me within 24 hours I'm okay with that just send my ashes back to my home country that may not be as easy as the words just came out of my mouth <sighs> yeah I know my father and my stepmother were on a ship they were in port in Lisbon, in Portugal, and it took weeks for my dad to get his beloved wife back to Scotland. So none of this is easy, especially since COVID. There's just so many things to consider and to think about, and you have to have some plan ahead of time. You have to have some things plugged in so that you have a support system. So we have cards that we carry. And um, I might have it here, actually. Look, visual example. <laughs> so our doctor's name in, in and his name and number in San Miguel, any medications we're taking, any allergies, that sort of thing. And the death service number, Jardín Nueva Vida, which is the gardens of new life. And then on the other side, we have a U.S. number um, and our Mexican phone number, our address, our contact. And we have an account for something called SkyMed, who is um, if we are in, even if we are here in the States and we have an accident, then um, we can get helicopter service to somewhere to the nearest hospital. 
but also um, I have uh, my next door neighbor and my cultural mentors phone number on here and also my contact in the USA. So all of these are on this little card, carry it everywhere. And, and that sort of information and even that sort of planning, I think it's more front of mind as we get older, but yes. should also be considered for younger people because yes. stuff happens. Oh, yes, exactly. Yes. And I think the fact that we are, I think the fact that we are aging and that we are, you know, progressing towards our um, our due date or our overdue shelf life, whatever we want to call it, it makes us more conscious of it. And I think it's important to become conscious of all of these aspects. <laughs> so much food for thought. I could yeah. keep this going for another hour. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a podcast, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. You sometimes talk to your guests about lessons learned. Are there any stories that come to mind quickly? Oh, wow. <laughs> so many, so many lessons learned. Um, I, I have a podcast coming out on Tuesday um, by a fellow called Roy Kraft, and he worked for he worked as a consultant for the uh, automobile industry in Japan in Tokyo. In fact, we fi figured out we were both in Tokyo or that environment area at the same time. And he he talked about questions and he talked about positive interrogation <laughs> or something like that. And he actually was fab fascinating an example and stories about you know when you're in Japan the the address numbers are not sequential and they're not logical and many of them can be upstairs downstairs sideways and so we were just discussing how complex that life is and why why would we expect it to be logical well we would expect it to be logical because of where we've come from right we would expect it to be logical because we grew up in a, a, a sort of a western culture and that's not what life looks like here so that was a really fun story and we compla compared notes about being delivered by taxi somewhere in japan and the taxi driver just opens the doors and expects you to get out and you have no idea where you are. And he has no idea where the building is either. So that was that was really, really fun to talk to him. And I had so many stories. Uh, the person after that is a woman called Robin Pasco, and she's an expert on expats. And uh, she's lived all over the world, but now she is in Costa Rica with her family, helping her daughter uh, and son and her husband. They're all in a family, little family uh, project, so, which is led by her daughter in natural habitat and the environment, saving some of the environment in Costa Rica. So just fascinating stories. The stories I get to hear every day are really wonderful i'm i consider myself the luckiest podcast host on the planet second luckiest <laughs> second luckiest well that's good i'm uh, glad you love your community too yeah yeah i absolutely do um and i will clarify for that community that if you're going to go look for that particular podcast episode that we are recording this a couple of weeks before it goes live so they may want to go back a couple of weeks on your podcast to find uh, any of those stories that you just mentioned may I ask you a personal question sure now you've partially answered it I think uh, but you're writing a book called Aftermath how to move home after living overseas which changed since I wrote that sorry I need to change that to oh, see well, what, I, what I was going to say is, or my question was, are you returning to Scotland for your later years? But it sounds like, no, you're in San Miguel for, for the rest of whatever. So, so why that subject? Um, why repatriation? I guess, yeah. Because um, I think that repatriating, um, number one, my first repatriation to London was so jarring and I was so ill-prepared. And it was a disaster. Well, I remember in my head now, it, it it felt like a disaster. 
Number two, when I moved to the U.S., I think partially some of the reasons that my marriage fell apart within 90 days was my husband couldn't handle repatriation. Now, I wasn't repatriating because I'd never lived here, but he was. And number three, because when I repatriated to um, America from Saudi back to Bellingham, it was hard and nobody talks about it. Very, very few people. The reason I am writing this book is because I don't think that we are addressing the right things people talk about. Well, start a year ahead of time and sell up all your belongings and yada yada. But they're not being trained in build yourself a transition team. Who is on your transition team? And how are they going to support you during this move? And what is the influence of transition fatigue on you? Do you know about transition fatigue? What is it? And how might it affect you? Go learn about that. They don't understand about the amazingly mammoth amounts of self-care necessary to thrive in repatriation. Nobody's talking about all those things. So I thought, well, I guess it's my job. Okay. And you know, um, I've, been, I've been working on this book since I finished Life in the Camel Lane, like four years ago. And so I need to get it off my chest. I just need to finish this. Well, I think when I saw the, the, the title, I was thinking, oh, are we going to get some scoop on foreshadowing here? But obviously, no, this is just a book that you you need to get out to the, the public. And, yes, uh, and I am, no, I have no intention. I will go back to Scotland for months at a time. But I, I realistically feel like to adjust, to make the adjustments at this period, at this age in my life, would be huge. Now, if I went back for a year and I discovered I loved it and I could handle it, I might. But as of today, I have no plans to go back to Scotland forever. And besides which, our lifestyle in in Mexico is very healthy. We have sun, we have light, we have a living out indoor, outdoor situation. And, you know, may, things may change in Mexico but I don't expect that will change. And our food supply is wonderful. Okay, tell us about Nomadic Diaries, the business, please. Yeah, Nomadic Diaries, the business? Well, Nomadic Diaries, um, I think has been a part of my, I think has been part of my mental zeitgeist for probably about five years. But it wasn't until finally AI and podcasting and time and not constantly nomading, all sort of met in one super confluence that it was time for me to start my podcast. And so I started it in October. We have about 50 something episodes out. Um, many of them are short, but I interview someone. I've been putting some, one interview out I usually do this sort of format Agnes I'm interviewing a guest I interview mostly authors and experts in the expat and the nomadic field and I have lots of connections with super duper authors across the globe and so I'm very fortunate that I have a great network and also intercultural specialists because I think interculturalism seems like a very brainy subject and I it's kind of my mission to explain it to the rest of the world um, and interview these people who really know it well so that people can understand why it's important because we're crossing cultures every day and we're we're unaware of it. So I think it's really important to talk about that. So that's what Nomadic Diaries is. I I talk to people who are expats, nomads, repats, experts, and it's fun. Okay. When I saw the CEO of Nomadic Diaries on your profile, <laughs> I thought it was like maybe you did some coaching or something like that, but but it's the, the, the podcast is Nomadic Diaries. Podcast is Nomadic Diaries. I am a certified coach. Okay. I have done life coaching. I writing this book with an eye to it being a course to selling these courses online. Number one, how to launch to go overseas. And number two, how to return home. 
Okay. Listen, That's enough to be you. CEO of. Come <laughs> no, on. Absolutely. <laughs> it's just you went straight to the podcast. So I thought, okay, maybe I misunderstood. No, oh, I love the podcast because I'm having the most fun in that. And I mean, come on, at our age, don't we deserve to have fun? <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Before we get your website, et cetera, I'm going to challenge you. You keep on talking about you know, you, you talk to this expert in something and this other professional about something. And it's like, you could well be one stop shopping, especially with this podcast now where you're also interviewing people. You know, I, I, I don't want you to sell yourself short. Oh, cause... no. Yeah. I, but I know the questions to ask. Oh, no, and, absolutely. Yeah. As I've lived through all this. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever get answers that are a bit of a surprise? Sometimes. Somebody else's take on something. Yeah, yeah. Especially from people in younger generations who are in the nomadic lane. And especially mostly when people haven't thought about a subject, like I'm all about all about this purpose. What, what is your purpose? Why are you traveling? Why are you going here? Because you're making a huge commitment. You're moving your, your finances, your legal situation, your residence, you're moving your life, and your life is precious. So why are you doing this? And so to come back to the purpose, I've decided that Nomadic Diaries is for me the best possible purpose that I could be sharing right now. Excellent. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you think boomer women should be considering? Not really. I think you were very thorough. You asked great questions. And um, I just hope for your listeners that if you are on the fence and you're considering moving overseas, put your foot in the water and test it. Go for three months, six months, or a year and test it out and see how you respond. Because a lot of it is in your response time. And, you know, there's no there's no uh, foreigner on the planet. There are no foreigners. The only foreigner is really who we become in the process. And it's getting to know yourself and your journey. And what is the difference you can make by crossing a culture? A good way to wrap. Where do we find you on the World Wide Web? Oh, just go to Nomadic Diaries. I'm starting a blog there, so there will be there will be words. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a I have a website. Okay. It's been a little neglected. It's Doreen, uh, www.doreenmcumberford.com. It's just my name. Um, also, the book, Life in the Camel Lane, is on uh, Amazon, Life in the Camel Lane. And the other book is Arriving Well, Stories of Belonging and Identity When Returning from Overseas. I've had so many um, tabs open on my other monitor here that I'm not finding yours really quickly. But oh, don't worry is, about the book, is the book is the book is the book available on your website or do we just go straight to Amazon? Oh, they're both on Amazon. Okay. Oh, are you on social? Yes. Oh, yes. All the usual. Yes, all the usual. I'm on LinkedIn, and I'm on LinkedIn, and I am on. Facebook under Nomadic Diaries and also just Doreen M. Cumberford. Okay, that's great. Our website link is in the show notes and all the links are on your page at our website. Listeners, if you have thoughts on today's show, please talk to us. Leave comments where you're listening or if you're listening at the Boomer Woman's podcast at boomwithabang.com, scroll to the bottom of the page and talk to us there. Retiring somewhere nicer is a dream many of us have considered. Tell us your favored destination, and perhaps Doreen has some experience she can share with you. Leave stars and reviews where you can. They help us move up the charts. And share this episode. Moving countries is sometimes a thought we keep to ourselves. Maybe a friend of yours is keeping her thoughts to herself. This episode will start a conversation that may reap you a travel partner. Hmm. <laughs> Doreen Cumberford, thank you for being my guest today, for sharing your own experiences, but also enticing us to make this dream a reality. 
You're welcome. It was my privilege and my pleasure to be here. I wish all of your listeners the best of joy in their next step. A big step, but it's going to be a, a, a positive one. Have a great rest of the week. Mm-hmm.